welcome to this oh, welcome to this evening's event, everyone, and thank you for joining. I'm Annie McGowan with the Hellenic American Cultural Center and Museum, also referred to as HACCM. I have the pleasure tonight of introducing our moderator, Thomas Spathis. Thomas was born and raised in Portland, Oregon. And also a fun fact about Thomas is that he was the youngest Dairy Queen owner in the United States at the age of 20. Thomas attended Oregon State University and started his own ad agency in Portland, Oregon and is now semi-retired. He's very vested in his semi-retirement in doing pro bono work for Holy Trinity Greek Orthodox Cathedral, AHEPA, the Portland chapter, and also the Hellenic American Cultural Center and Museum. Let's get this event started and I'm happy to introduce Thomas. Thank you, Annie. Uh, greetings to everyone here on the first day of spring. On behalf of the Hellenic American Cultural Center and Museum in Portland, Oregon, I'd like to welcome all of you that have come to join us for today's special event. Hackam is proud to be able to sponsor events like this, and we look forward to presenting many more. We appreciate donations from our followers such as you to help us continue to fund future events, both online and at our museum location in Portland, Oregon. You can donate at any time by going to HellenicAmericanCC.org, so over the top of my screen, and clicking on the support button. Before we get started, I'd like to lay out some basic ground rules. First of all, please keep your mic muted and video camera turned off during the entire presentation. Do not use the chat options. But you will see in the chat menu, there is a link there for the donations as well. There will be a question and answer session at the end of the presentation, and we ask that you submit any questions you have by using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. The questions will be saved until the end of the presentation. The book, The Forgotten Heroes of the Balkan Wars, Greek Americans and Phil Hellenes, 1912-1913, is available from your favorite book resellers, as long as they are Annie Bloom's books or Powell's books in the Portland local market, or online at Barnes & Noble or from Amazon Kindle. And now about our guest speaker. Peter S. Giacumis is an author, historical consultant, and researcher of Greek military history. His main focus is the Greek Americans of the early 20th century. Mr. Giacumis served as a reserve captain, Army Division, New York Guard for six years. He's the vice president of Byzantine Crown Productions, a history-based production company that promotes the accurate portrayal of Hellenistic culture, Hellenic culture, excuse me. He holds a master's degree in international relations and has published various works in print and online. The poet Alexander Pope is quoted as saying, a little learning is a dangerous thing. Drink deep and or taste not the Pyrenean spring. Clearly, Mr. Giacomas, you have drunk deep on this subject. Your book is a one of a kind volume that provides a broad, thorough examination of all things related to the Balkan Wars. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored to introduce to you, Mr. Peter Giacomas. Well, thank you, Tom. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you very much to the Hellenic American Cultural Center and Museum of Oregon in Southwest Washington and uh, everyone else that's uh, joining us tonight. I appreciate you hosting me and um, having this book talk. I tried to, in my research and in my publication, uh, I tried to find every little corner that I could. And believe me, there was uh, plenty of information I ended up finding and um, your neck of the woods, uh, Oregon and, and Southwest Washington uh, were represented in the um, Greek American pioneer era and the Balkan Wars. So I am going to go ahead and start a presentation, uh, a slideshow that I have uh, for uh, my presentation tonight. And I'm going to let you know that uh, I have based what you're going to see, the bulk of it, of course, is uh, it comes directly from my book. I did add a few visuals uh, and a little bit of uh, extra content just to spice things up, but it all directly comes from my work and my research. So again, thank you everyone for tuning in and joining us tonight. And so um, let me just, uh, first things first is to set this up. I need everyone tonight that are familiar with you know, the, uh, the map of Greece as we know it today. Uh, in 1912, just before the, uh, the wars began in uh, late 1912, uh, Greece was half the size of what it is today. So imagine a map and Greece being a very, very small 
half of what it is without the islands and none of the islands, just a small little area, the Peloponnese, basically. That's what Greece was prior to 1912 and the outcomes of uh, two wars. The first one, the Balkan War of 1912-13, was against the Ottoman Empire, you know, what we commonly refer to as Turkey. It began October 8, 1912, uh, and lasted to May 17, 1913. And Greece was a part of a league. Uh, they had allies. It was called the Balkan League. So Bulgaria, Serbia, Montenegro, and Greece teamed up against Turkey. And the uh, second war that followed in 19, 1913 is uh, the, uh, the Balkan War of 1913. And it was specifically against uh, Bul uh, Bulgaria. So there was just those two wars, and they are short wars. They are not long. And the second one was June 16th, 1913 to July 20th, 1913. And it was basically Greece and Serbia creating an alliance. Um, Romania came in very much at the end of that uh, short war against Bulgaria. And the outcome was, like I'd said, the that uh, Greece was victorious in both cases. Um, I just want to make sure that everybody can actually see the uh, presentation. Uh, I don't have a, a problem with uh, narrating, of course, but I just want to make sure that uh, we're all good. So if someone could just give me a quick heads up, just to make sure that you guys all are following along with uh, the presentation, I would truly appreciate that just in case we're having technical problems. Peter, we're not able to see the presentation, just you. Okay, so, but are you guys, are you guys okay with it? Can you see the uh, the slides? No. I just, no. So, no. let me make sure that we're actually sharing, because I just got a heads up that it's not being shared. So let's try this again. I'll click everything up again, and we'll start it up once more. And I think I just got the word that it's up. Is it up? Yep. Yes. Should be I up see. now? Okay, good. Can you guys, you can see this now, right? Perfect. Okay, good. All right, so uh, this is basically, this is, I think, right, guys? Are we, I'm sharing, is that correct? You are, yep. I, I'm getting, yeah, we're good? Tom? Yes, you're good. All right. So let me then just continue on. I just basically uh, wanted that, you know, a quick little uh, slide on, you know, what the wars were. They were quite short and that might be at, at the root of why they're forgotten. But um, this, of course, is my project to uh, make sure that uh, we bring it back to life and that we appreciate what went on and what the sacrifices were. And um, the modern Greek immigration uh, flow uh, of the early 1900s is directly linked to uh, the bigger story. And there's basically four uh, eras of uh, migration from Greece to the United States. And of course, the one that we're interested in tonight is the one that began approximately in 1890 and uh, ran its course to 1922. So by 1910, in the intermountain states of, say, for example, Utah, Montana, Colorado, Wyoming, Idaho, there were no less than 11,000 Greek workers. Uh, proportional numbers of Greeks appear to have worked in California, Oregon, and Washington. So now we're, we're pushing numbers between 20 and 30,000 um, at this time. So from 1902 to 1911, uh, the statistics show us that there was a total of 241,000 Greeks in the United States, which is uh, quite a number. Uh, so very quickly, as an overview, why leave Greece for America? Right? What, was, what was the point of you know, leaving the homeland as small as it may have been, um, why did they leave? And it's obvious that they couldn't take care of the needs. There was a failed economy. It was a fourth uh, bankruptcy um, of the modern state declared in 1893. There was a war of 1897 against Turkey and Greece lost. Another very, very short war, but it was a loss and it impacted the psyche of uh, the Hellenic people. There was no industry, no significant exports, and basically a ruined national economy with no work, 
left people in a big, big state of need. So the United States, you know, America, where the streets are paved in gold, um, was in a big need for migrant workers. There was plenty going on, the Industrial Revolution in the United States, and life in the U.S. Um, was interesting, at least from our perspective. And so I wanted to make sure that at least in my work in the book, you'll see there is background information. Uh, at the time, you know, gas was seven cents a gallon. A loaf of bread cost five cents. Eggs, a uh, dozen eggs were 34 cents. And um, I included a few extra, you know, tidbits of uh, information to give it all context. The average home price was just short of $6,000. And the average annual income at that time was $564, um, a little bit in terms of uh, current events. So what was going on in uh, you know, the United States in 1912, right? So those Greeks that were here, um, what was going on around them? And they were very aware of what was going on. Um, New Mexico becomes a 47th state in January. Um, by February 14th, Arizona was admitted to the union as the 48th state. Uh, of course, 1912, everybody knows that the Titanic sank and there were Olympic Games in Stockholm, Sweden. And everybody, everyone here and around the world, of course, we're all watching those Olympic Games. And then uh, August, um, Progressive Bull Moose Party nominates Teddy Roosevelt for president. And of course, there were elections and that was what was going on. But the Greeks in America, what were they doing? Well, majority of these immigrants were single young men who came from the southern peninsula of Greece, um, of course, to survive economic chaos. They expected to work hard in America and purchase Greek land for their families from the money that they would send back. They also had to provide dowries for their sisters. The majority of these immigrants had been rural farmers, um, and they tended to settle in some of the bigger cities of the United States. But that doesn't mean that these men were illiterate peasants. By no stretch of the imagination, um, they actually, here in the United States, established and read dozens of newspapers. There was a bookstore, a Greek language bookstore in Brooklyn, New York at the time. So these people um, weren't just uh, a rabble. They were hardworking individuals, and they were in all different types of uh, jobs which was very interesting. Uh, so the concept of, Amer of uh, Greek Americans being in the restaurant business is not something from the 60s, 70s, or 80s. That goes all the way back to the early 1900s. And of course, shoe shine, candy, ice cream, uh, barber shops, coffee houses, uh, blue collar work included lumber, coal mines, construction, railroad, um, smelters, strike breakers, and all everything in between. By late 1912, uh, war is definitely imminent. Not the first time, not the first time that it was believed that war would break out, but by late 1912, it was pretty much uh, a given. And the Greek Americans, of course, respond to the call. Um, one of the units, uh, one of the groups that got together uh, were um, uh, Greeks that had actually banded uh, together, uh, not by their uh, geographical region that they came from, but for the fact that they were Greeks and they lived in wherever they lived, the cities, and they formed um, these Greek military units or clubs, and they would outfit themselves and they would actually uh, uh, drill, and they formed what was then known as the Sacred Battalions. Usually, we refer to Sacred Battalions to the World War II unit but uh, they formed what was then referred to as sacred battalions, and they did see action in uh, the Balkan Wars. And on this slide, you'll see for yourselves, this is the Volunteer New York Company, and in, they're in the courtyard of the Annunciation Greek Orthodox Church in New York. Uh, they numbered a little bit more than what you see here. They were closer to 200 active members. Uh, they're dressed in U.S. Army uniforms, and they represent a type of uniform that was uh, designed right be and used right prior to uh, World War I. So they're missing the Smokey the Bear 
hats that you usually see the American doughboy wearing, but this is the hat that they wore. And this is not the only place that these volunteer companies were formed. Uh, they were formed in Seattle, Martin Ferry, Ohio, West Virginia, Rhode Island, Lowell and Haverfill, um, and in Philadelphia and Pennsylvania. There was other places in Pennsylvania, including Pittsburgh, of course, and Chicago. And they banded some of these together and they actually took the voyage over to Greece. And um, to get there, of course, there had to be fundraising. Some of the men paid their own way, but the Greeks uh, themselves uh, across the nation uh, had various fundraisers to help the, these, uh, the reservists get to Greece. And they also raised money for uh, the Red Cross and for the purchase and outfitting of a naval destroyer, which was named the New Generation. And every donation along with the person's name uh, was listed. And even someone that gave a dime was published by the newspaper, The Atlantis, which was a, a dominant newspaper of the time and a very much active in organizing and helping the, uh, the Greeks of this time get back to Greece. Uh, the number one organizer was, of course, the Panhellenic Union, which was established in 1907 and had over 100 chapters nationwide. And contrary to some, um, it was established as a civic organization. It was not established by the Greek government. It was established in the United States. And at the time that the need arose, the 1912 Balkan Wars, uh, the Panhellenic Union then uh, stepped into the forefront and helped organize things, um, including the Greek consuls. One of them that uh, we know a lot about or that it becomes prevalent around this time is uh, Dimitris, Dimitrios Botasis. He's the consul general in New York, uh, as well as uh, Nico, Nicolaus or Nicholas Salopoulos and local clergy. Uh, and the established business leaders all contributed, all helped everyone stay organized and, uh, and focused uh, to help with the arrangements for the Greeks that had to get back to fight and help their uh, fatherland, motherland, or patrida. So the call to arms officially was broadcast uh, October 4th from the Greek embassy in Washington, D.C., um, actually on the 2nd. But it was uh, telegrammed and covered in American newspapers pretty much uh, on the 4th. So by October 4th, the word was now making its way around to all newspapers. And it was that all Greeks who are now in the United States and who have served in the Greek Army and Navy between 1896 and 1911 are now hereby ordered to get back to Greece in uniform or to get into uniform uh, because there is now active duty. So that was a requirement. Uh, however, that doesn't mean that everyone went and we know uh, that there were volunteers. So anyone that was um, born and had not born in Greece and had not served was obligated to serve. Those men that had been in the military and now were called reservists. They were considered reservists by the Greek military, the Greek government. They had to get back. But we know that there were thousands of Greeks from all over uh, within the Greek kingdom and without that actually volunteered that had they were not obligated in any other reason other than what uh, Greeks refer to as uh, philotimo, you know, the honor and the responsibility. Here's a great picture that was, uh, this was published in uh, New York newspapers, including uh, the Times. Uh, we were off for the war. And what's interesting is that uh, those that are pictured in the hats are, uh, those are the Greek Americans. And then you can see them all around uh, in the smaller picture, uh, getting ready, putting up their, uh, all their luggage and getting ready to make their way down to the port of New York City. And I was able to uh, discover uh, a lot of the different places that they came from. So they came from big and small towns, um, big cities, big states, from west to east coast, and then some. Uh, it was fascinating. I discovered that there were Greeks all the way in Hawaii and Alaska, and they dropped what they had to their work, everything that they were involved in, 
and they made their way back to Greece. So that's one heck of a, an adventure, never mind from Seattle or Oregon, from you know the opposite end uh, from where I am, New York City, the opposite end of, New York, of uh, the United States, to make their way to New York City. Because that's where that was the port. That was the main port that everybody congregated at. And they all came from Sacramento, Los Angeles, um, Colorado, Wyoming, Idaho, and you name it. Every single, basically every single state is represented at this time. They all make their way basically by train and they get to New York City. And we have uh, evidence of uh, various individuals. Um, and here's an example, October 17, 1912, 15 Greeks leave Astoria, Oregon for the war. Um, another 100 Greek businessmen on that day leave LA on a special train for the war. Train stops in Salt Lake City, Denver, Kansas City, Chicago, and Buffalo to pick up others. A second wave of 300 Greeks kneel to pray before leaving Davenport, Iowa to fight the Turk. First, first group was made up of 500 Greeks and 140 Bulgarians, taking with them 30,000 U.S. dollars. Uh, and that's 1912 money. Another 200 Greeks leave Utah, 65 Greeks uh, leave Oak Creek, 400 men from Nashua, New Hampshire, and that's all October 17th, never mind the dates before and after. And then um, I, I picked another date, December 18th of 1912, 30 Greeks from Palmer Lumber near La Grande leave, 15 quit jobs in Huntington, and 30 left from Pasco last night, which is uh, over in your neck of the woods over in, um, I believe, Oregon and Southwest Washington. And then, of course, more from all over. Uh, in one case, there was uh, an individual and an, uh, a named individual that I found. His name was Gus Stamatas, and he was a former sergeant in the Greek Army and a former corporal in the California Volunteers. So he's serving in the military in the United States, and he had six years of service in the Philippines. So he was basically in the National Guard. Um, that's from the New York Times, October 29, 1912. Um, and a local San Francisco military supply store outfitted the volunteers that were coming from San Francisco. And so that's how they appear in some pictures, uh, some very rare pictures in those U.S. Army uniforms. Uh, more to be said in a little bit about that. But um, here is Thomas Setzer Hutchison. He's a, a retired brigadier general at this point, And he was in the National Guard of Tennessee. He held various positions uh, in Nashville. And he actually volunteered to fight in Greece. He um, was uh, a major. Uh, was given the commission of a, of a major in uh, the Greek army assigned to the Garibaldi Legion. He saw combat at the Battle of Bizani. He was wounded and he was honorably discharged. And he wrote a firsthand account of his experiences, uh, of, of a fantastic book uh, about what he saw, uh, of course, uh, in, in English. He did learn some Greek and uh, he was friends with Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, he was progressive and he was a, a businessman, and um, it's just incredible, the sacrifices. Uh, a true Phil Helene, um, Brigadier General Hutchison was, and I was, uh, I was lucky enough to find his, his descendants, and they allowed me to use his uh, personal uh, archive, to, uh, and I included that, uh, what I found in my book. Uh, here is um, uh, the, one, of the, one of the ships, the steam liners, the Madonna, that actually carried those uh, Greek Americans or Americanized Greeks to Greece to fight. And here's two excellent pictures I uncovered of the men themselves. So now we get to see these guys a little bit. You know, they're not just, uh, you know, words on a page, but they're actually uh, great looking guys. And they, they, they get holding their, hand, their hats in, in one picture and, and they're smiling and, and, you know, they're doing what they believe is the right thing. Um, and here is, of course, that uh, voyage, right? Going from all over the United States, making their way over to Greece. And when they get there, they first go to the port of Pirea, 
right? And so they get to Pirea, that's where everybody disembarks. And that's where the Greek government, the military is meeting and greeting everyone. And they're assigning them their responsibilities. And once, they, once they're assigned, they get on a train and they make their way to Athens. And in Athens, then they join their uh, regiments uh, or ships if they're in the Navy. And I included a couple of pictures here just to give us a little bit of context. Uh, you'll see that the upper left hand is Odos Ermu. Um, that's the street. And then this is what the Parthenon looked like, Acropolis. And then there is a picture in the, uh, that's uh, Omonia in the bottom right-hand corner, right? And then, of course, uh, I was able to find the arrival of the Philadelphia Volunteer Unit uh, to fight in the Balkan Wars. And if you look very carefully in the upper right-hand corner of the slide, you'll see that the men in the middle that are dressed in U.S. Army uniforms are those Philadelphia Volunteers. And um, they have a 48-star flag, American flag with them. And then, of course, they have uh, the Greek flag. And those men were brought together with uh, the, those that uh, came in previously, the, uh, the New York uh, Regiment. And they all formed up into one big unit. And they actually saw combat in Ioannina, in Nipiro, in those U.S. Army uniforms. They actually uh, paraded in Athens. Uh, they were interviewed in the newspapers and then made their way up to the front. Since they were armed, they just sent them right up and they did see action, which is uh, quite incredible. So 1912, Greece acclaims its sons, the Sacred Battalion. That is the cry which greeted the contingent of Greek volunteers, 700 in number uh, that arrived uh, this evening, uh, which is for you know then October 26 from New York. And there is way more information that I ever believed I would find following these individuals. Sometimes, uh, like I just said, in uh, a unit, uh, specifically, I was able to discover uh, the uh, end result to a few of these uh, units, like the ones from Massachusetts, uh, which was never published before. No one knew actually the details of what had happened to some, some of them specifically. But we do know that the majority of the men that left, um, they returned to the United States. Um, they did not stay in Greece. And those individuals are the ones that helped establish uh, our um, uh, communities and our churches. Uh, so those that did came back with brides. Some of them that came back married, uh, a good number of them married uh, American women. And they came here to basically stay. Uh, I also found out some other information that I thought was fascinating that the, um, the Greek government uh, really did value and appreciated the service of these individuals. And uh, in one occasion, and this is not the only one, but this is the one I have here for you. There's more in the book. But on October 10, 1914 in Chicago, 143 American Greek veterans were presented with their medals uh, that were sent over by the king which was very, very interesting. Uh, and this, like I said, was not the only city that um, had that privilege. So they were taken seriously and they were appreciated. And here is some an example of some of the coverage that uh, I discovered. Uh, this is the story of uh, one individual uh, named Harry Frangoyanis. And he had volunteered with a couple hundred uh, individuals that came from the unredeemed areas of Greece. They were outside the Greek kingdom, in this case uh, from Lesvos, Mytilini, and they formed a special unit uh, to go back to Greece to liberate their island, and they did. These men fought uh, and liberated Lesvos and um, came back. And in the article itself, it's a full page article from the San Francisco Chronicle, published 16 November 1913. Uh, Frangoyanis was interviewed, and that was typical of uh, a lot of what uh, was covered back then. There were a lot of interviews, a lot of pictures, a lot of names, uh, more than I really would ever thought would be uh, in existence. And his story is very, very interesting. However, um, the story of these veterans doesn't end there. Um, obviously, they came back to live, established the communities, but um, many, many of them 
actually volunteered and enlisted in the United States Army in World War I. Um, and the most famous of the actual Balkan War veterans is Sergeant Hercules Corgis or uh, Harry Corgis. Uh, he's a Greek American hero. Um, he received one, two, three, four, five, no less than five medals for his distinguished service. Uh, he uh, attained the rank of sergeant in the U.S. Army, and his actual um, his his feats and his accomplishments, his heroics, are documented, and they are beyond belief. He is one of the uh, one of the only soldiers, U.S. Army soldiers, to. Uh, capture uh, a, the significant, a significant number single-handedly of enemy troops. Um, and he captured, uh, I, I, I don't exactly remember the number off the top of my head, but it is extremely significant uh, and wounded at the same time. And he captured uh, uh, dozens, dozens of German troops. And um, so that is somebody that um, deserves to be um, remembered and uh, it's a shame that uh, some of these individuals like him, their stories have been kind of lost to time. But he is representative of the um, uh, ethnic majority of Greeks. There was, we represented a lot of people that actually joined the U.S. Army in World War I. Um, so uh, in terms of what the accomplishment was, what did the Greeks of America do to help their ancestral home? Well, they did a few things. They raised over... Four hundred thousand nineteen twelve dollars in two thousand seven. That equaled to eight million eight hundred twenty four thousand dollars, and that was all to help the cause, either to get them meant to Greece and or to buy the destroyer and or for the Red Cross and or for uh, the orphans. Um, there were funds that were established for orphans as well. Uh, they enlisted to fight, and according to Professor Doctor Vlahos, uh, he says. His figures are 57,000 immigrants returned home to join the Greek army. Uh, King Constantine I is quoted as saying there were 45,000 uh, Greek Americans that served, and that would make it so a third of the Greek army that was raised in 1912 was made up of Greek Americans, which is astonishing. Uh, most of the, the men that actually left did return to the United States. Most of them helped, like I said, establish the communities. And of course, the outcome was that Greece, modern Greece, uh, won two decisive victories. Uh, there basically is no other war uh, in the history of modern Greece that uh, outside of, of course, you know, uh, independence in 1821, um, that Greece won, right? So we're talking about 1900 and after, these are the two greatest uh, victories. Um, Greece doubles its geography and population. And it is astonishing that, uh, and slightly unfortunate that we don't know as much as we should, but um, that is part of what I wanted to uh, do was to bring this back to light and bring it back to life. And so here we are. Um, I, uh, I hope that I was able to uh, enliven some of this, um, make it uh, uh, better understood, and uh, I'm prepared. If anyone has any questions, I'm more than happy to give uh, answers to the best of my ability. Um, and uh, I thank everybody for tuning in. And um, Tom, what, do we have any, uh, any questions? Well, thank you. That was very fascinating and interesting. And there are a number of questions that are popping in. I'd like to remind everybody, if you'd like to submit any questions, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And I'll start uh, passing them off now. The first question was, wasn't Prussia the instigator of the Balkan League? Was Prussia? Okay, so the... the question um, Russia, but I don't... Yeah, you Russia, know. actually, there was uh, the Russia itself... Uh, was one of the major powers that was creating a, uh, what they wanted to do was create a Slavic union and bring together the Slavic countries and uh, create an alliance. However, the Austro-Hungarian Empire um, was 
on a constant war footing. They had uh, earlier absorbed uh, Bosnia Herzegovina. Uh, they wanted a piece of the action, and uh, they had actually mobilized. Uh, Austria Hungary had mobilized their military in 1912, and were just waiting for an opportunity to uh, take action against Serbia. And it was uh, a dicey situation that was being watched by everyone. Now, Italy, um, Italy in 1911 uh, had uh, declared war on the Ottoman Empire and invaded Libya and took Tripoli. And uh, Venizelos was um, very aware of that situation. He knew that things were not going well. Uh, it was inevitable that there was going to be a war. And so he was kind of waiting uh, for the right time. He was building up the Greek military and would probably have preferred to wait longer, except Italy pushed Montenegro into declaring war. And because of the pacts and the alliances that they had, it brought everybody else in, Serbia and Greece and Bulgaria. Thank you. Uh, next question. What official U.S. archival sources did you use besides newspapers? Oh, well, actually, um, I was able to find uh, contemporary writers. Believe it or not, there's a, a, a host of uh, writers, uh, authors, and historians, uh, including um, one of the former ambassador to Greece at the time, uh, also wrote books. And um, there were uh, a variety of U.S. sources uh, to include um, military records, military uh, official military records, both state and federal, uh, as well as reports. There were uh, multiple reports written by uh, embedded U.S. Army officers that were assigned to missions overseas. And so they wrote uh, reports on what they saw um, that, that all these things have obviously been declassified. And so I, I was able to uncover a few of those. Uh, and I also got my hands on, um, uh, there's um, uh, various reports that are posted by ambassadors. And their responsibility is to basically update um, the State Department and the federal government on trade issues and cultural and contextual issues. So uh, some of those commerce reports I was able to find and, um, you know, dig into those and look at numbers and look at some of the situations on in terms of uh, finances, um, the uh, economic state of Greece, uh, money, exchange, verification of uh, numbers on how many they were uh, observing that had left the United States, uh, how that was going to impact the American economy, and um, that kind of thing. Thank you. Next question. Another reason of Greeks from the Asia Minor immigrating to the U.S. in the early 1900s was to avoid serving in the Turkish army as they were Ottoman citizens. Do we know anything about this? Yeah, we do. We, we know, we know uh, quite a bit. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, we know that that was one of the excuses that the Ottoman Empire eventually used um, in, in terms of uh, uh, they believed that their minorities, that their Christian minorities ultimately could never be trusted, that the, uh, the Christians uh, had time and time again proven that they were not good Ottoman citizens, that they would do everything in their power to not serve their country, you know, the, the you know, the Turkey, the, the Ottoman Empire, that they were not, you know, uh, uh, worthy of being a part of it since they didn't see themselves as. And so this came, you know, came to haunt everybody later on in terms of, you know, the ethnic cleansing and the exchanges uh, we know, I uncovered that there were um, entire units of, uh, you know, Christians, Greeks, predominantly, not completely, but predominantly Greeks that were serving uh, under force in the Ottoman Empire that actually deserted and surrendered to Greek forces during the Balkan Wars. 
So, you know, it was, it became, um, it became sort of a problem, not to mention that um, some of the Greeks that were the Greek Christians that were serving in the Ottoman Empire in the military um, were uh, became double agents and they were feeding information from the inside to the Greek forces. And the, they be, the Ottomans became aware of this. And that's why they were like, all of these minorities got to go. Or at least it made it an excuse for them. Next question. The Greeks that left the U.S., did they leave families behind or were they only hardworking single men? Believe it or not, there was uh, a uh, respectable number of uh, Greek men that had brought their families here and or uh, created families. And also there were um, several hundred uh, individuals that were U.S. citizens or uh, made sure they got, they became naturalized before they left. So um, what they did in the cases of the men that were leaving behind families in the United States, uh, they created funds for them so that in case they died, um, there would be money for their widows. And in other cases, it got even more um uh, complicated they actually were able to set up sort of like a trust fund so just so that they're they're the wives um, and the kids would be able to have uh, their basic needs uh, taken care of while they were gone and fighting so when I mentioned you know that they raised a lot of this money they didn't all just send it all over to Greece they kind of set it up so that they could look out for those that were still here that had to stay interesting Okay, next question. What happened to the destroyer that was brought with the fund that was bought with the funding from the Greek Americans? Nagyanya actually got to see a little bit of action. It was deployed and it was part of uh, some of the operations uh, that took place in both the first and the second Balkan War. So they did they made sure that they uh, they deployed it. It was active. It, it did see some um, you know, mostly uh, escort maneuvers and movement of troops to areas of operations. Um, what was, if any, the penalty for not complying with the call to arms for those in the U.S. who had already served in the Greek armed forces? You know, that's, that's a really, really good question. Um, so some individuals never um, wanted to find out. They never went back. So um, as I was researching uh, my, my work, I got to travel around the United States and in some cases do some presentations. And what comes to mind right now is one that I did in Sacramento, California. I met uh, several descendants. And in some cases, what they told me was that they had family that um, decided they would never go back. That, that's it. They, they just weren't going back to Greece no matter what. And I guess they just didn't want to find out what the penalty would be. Uh, many of them, uh, many of them that didn't go back, um, some of these guys, depending on their age, if they ever did get back, they would end up having to be uh, conscripted. So they would put them in, you know, they wouldn't use, use them on front lines, but they would put them in uniform and they would have to serve out their, some of their, their time. Um, what was circulated, what was rumored was that they would go to jail. That's kind of what they, 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 they toned it back. They toned it back. They didn't see that there was a real need to threaten. The threats didn't need to be put out, but it was circulated that possible um, uh, incarceration, if they ever returned, ever, they would be incarcerated. Now, we all know that, you know, 1913 ended and 1914, World War I started in Europe. Um, World War I ended and in Greece, what followed was what we call the Asia Minor Catastrophe. There was another war. There was, you know, Greece invaded Asia Minor in 1919 to 1922. There was a genocide. There was an exchange. It was, it was destructive. 
So there is a, you know, various issues, problems that happened uh, in Greece. So, you know, some of this may have even been forgotten or, or lost. But um, if, if, you, if you went back during any of the crises and you hadn't served, you know, I don't think they put you in jail. They're just going to send you to boot, the boot camp or basic training. Interesting. Uh, I've been asked to take a quick commercial break and only ask to remind our viewers out there that if you'd like to help support the Hackham or the Hellenic American Cultural Center Museum to do more presentations of this nature, or I want to say thank you for this one, you have opportunities to donate at any time. Simply go to our website at HellenicAmericanCC.org and click on the donate uh, button. Or, and uh, we'd love to have your support and have future events like this or even bring, bring Peter back uh, either online or live in the future. So uh, thank you. That's the quick commercial stop I've got to do. And oh yeah, no to... problem. Please do, please do. Okay. I'd love to come back. Absolutely. We have several more questions for you. So we're not done yet. A lot of oh, let's are... go. Yeah. Next question is, uh, what about the Philippines from other countries? Were there substantial numbers also apart from the United States or American Philippines the, the largest group? Okay, so we, one of the things that we, we should is define our, our terms, right? So the, a Philhellene is a friend of Greeks, an ally, supporter of Greeks. So when we say, um, when we refer to anyone uh, as a Philhellene, it means that they are not, uh, they're not Greek themselves in any way, right? So um, Philhellenes then uh, would include General Hutchison, and there is a, there were many. There were many, believe it or not. So one of them, one of the other, one of the most famous uh, that was well known and respected was uh, Ricciotti Garibaldi, and he was the son of Giuseppe Garibaldi. Gar Garibaldi is the the father of uh, modern, the unifier of modern Italy. And he was the commander of the Red Shirts, and he's a very, very famous general. And he actually fought in Greece. He raised his own, uh, another unit, another Red Shirt unit, and fought in Greece in 1897. He brought his sons of age, and they were also part of that uh, um, Garibaldi Legion, and fought in 1897. His son... Ricciotti Garibaldi was also a lifelong military officer. He raised another unit, another Garibaldi unit, another red shirt unit and uh, regiment and fought in 1912 in Greece. So with him were uh, a few hundred, uh, it, there was uh, individuals from all over the world. So it included obviously Italians, it included uh at least a couple of Brits. There were uh, individuals from various nations that were represented in the Garibaldi Legion. It was made up of uh, two units. So the regiment had those that were non-Greek and the other one, which was under the command of uh, Alexander Romas, was made up of uh, Greek Americans or Americanized Greeks. And so those individuals that were not, they were not reservists. These are people, these are men that had no obligation to return to Greece because they were not part of the Greek kingdom. They'd never served in the military. These were just volunteers. So uh, they, that, they numbered approximately 1,200. So altogether about 2,400 uh, men under Garibaldi that fought in 1912, and their biggest battle was the Battle of Driscos, and unfortunately they were decimated, but they were recognized by imperial, by um, a royal decree, and they were given honorable discharges for their service, so they weren't, they didn't keep them for the second war, except for 300 men uh, under the Roma's command, they stayed. And they did uh, a couple of other things afterwards. So that's just a few of the, um, what we call the Philhellenes. There were others that, uh, that served in the Red Cross. 
Um, and there were others that uh, participated. There's a, a, a Captain Trapman, a uh, British, a former British officer, uh, army officer, and he did a whole bunch of things and he wrote a great book as well. And um, yeah, he, he's another Philhellene. And I tried to document as many as I could in my book uh, by name. Uh, some of them actually gave their lives. There is a, a, a British um, uh, individual um, that uh, he demanded to join the Greek army. He spoke Greek and he lived in Greece and he ultimately gave his life fighting in Greece, in the Greek army on the battlefields. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of them and it's incredible. Wow. Uh, the next soldier, our uh, next question, the soldier from the San Francisco that you had in your presentation was dressed the Solias, or the traditional costume of the soldiers from 1821. Was there a wish to continue the revolution in North Greece, in Northern Greece? Well, this was, this was the opportunity for the Greek kingdom to unite the unredeemed parts of um, uh, you know, areas that existed outside of the kingdom that were uh, uh, inhabited by Greeks, you know, Greek Christians. So this was going to help settle the Macedonian issue. Uh, so, and, and in effect, it did to the best of their uh, ability, right? So the war was the way to expand the, uh, the territory and unify, you know, Crete, Chios, um, you know, Mytilini, the islands, uh, you know, Epiros and, and uh, you know, Thessaloniki. And there were limitations. The limitations were, um, they, they were imposed by the powers. So, you know, the, the area that we, that is Albania today um, was protected by Italy. Italy at the time was a, a global power. It was one of the powers, one of the main powers and very close to Greece. So they had ensured the boundaries of uh, what, we, what, was, what became Albania. So there was a limit to how far, you know, Greece could fight and move north. Um, so there were, you know, areas and regions and things. Uh, for example, uh, King Constantine, one of his uh, dreams was to capture the capital of Bulgaria. So he was looking to stretch right, the boundaries of, of Greece then way into uh, what was then Bulgaria. And he was ordered to not do that. And he was ordered to take Thessaloniki instead, that if he continued north, that uh, there would probably be a problem that we would, we would not take Thessaloniki. And so he came back and he then um, took Thessaloniki and that is why we still have it. Otherwise, the Bulgarians would have actually uh, taken um, Thessaloniki, and who knows if we would have, would have ever gotten it. So there was a lot of diplomacy, and um, there was a lot that went on that was outside the control of the Greek nation. Speaking of that, the next question is, did the U.S. government play a role in the Balkan Wars? Well, the U.S. government did not play a direct role. What the United States government uh, decided was that there was pressure. Uh, the, uh, the Ottoman Empire did have uh, close ties with the United States at the time. There were uh, naval contracts and other uh, supply uh, and economic and trade um, uh, responsibilities between the two. Um, and what the United States did was they preferred to allow things to play out the way they did. So hundred millions, millions and millions of dollars left the United States and went to Greece. So even before the war, um, the Greek government, uh, the, the American government allowed these Greeks to arm themselves, to, to buy weapons, to get surplus uniforms, uh, to then leave. Right, they just they just left um, the Ottoman Empire, and the ambassador was constantly um, uh, putting in formal complaints 
that the American government was allowing these individuals to organize and to uh, outfit themselves and to, you know, collect these large amounts of money to help, uh, you know, Greece and weren't doing anything. And there's editorials that have been published um, by the uh, Ottoman ambassador and the United States was like, they, they just allowed all this to happen. They, they took a, a back seat. As a matter of fact, the American people, right? The, the public, the American public was fascinated with this concept. Um, it's also interesting to note that the, um, the Ottoman Empire declared the Balkan Wars uh, jihad. And they had fatwas issued um, against uh, all of the Christian nations that they were fighting. So they kind of pushed this into a, um, a religious uh, war. Um, they did everything they could to try to, to try to win, you know, maintain the minds and, 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 and win, right? And, but they had inter internal turmoil as well. They were having major issues. So yeah, the American government didn't take a, a direct role, but they kind of let things unfold uh, on their own, which was, which was something to be said. Uh, the next question is, what do you think of a comparative study of Greeks in the U.S., Australia, Britain, and Canada fighting in the Balkan Wars? Yeah, that would be fascinating. As a matter of fact, uh, I know that uh, the Egyptians, the Egyptian Greeks, um, uh, they fought. And I believe the Egyptian Greeks are the second largest number, but nowhere in comparison to the Greek Americans. Um, and there is a uh, Greek Egyptian uh, that was, uh, there is a story uh, written about uh, him. He was an engineer. Um, and he had been working for a French company, uh, laying in tracks, and I believe it was in Asia Minor. And uh, when the war broke out, of course, he dropped everything and, and went to Greece uh, and volunteered to fight in the Greek army. Again, an, an Egyptian Greek that had no obligation, but he did. And he encountered uh, General Hutchison. And Hutchison wrote a series of uh, magazine articles that were published in um, the um, uh, one of the Chicago newspapers. Uh, of course, that newspaper, the Saloniki does not exist. It hasn't existed in years. Um, the archive itself is, um, it's, it's actually was donated, but to a university, but it's not accessible. I was lucky that through his archive, his personal collection, uh, General Hutchison um, actually had his own clippings of the articles. And so I have those in my book. Uh, the Cyprians, they uh, raised a unit, uh, about, about 200 men that actually volunteered. And uh, some of them did, uh, they saw action, were killed in combat. Um, and there were some Brits. Uh, there were some uh, Greeks from France. Uh, there's a matter of fact, there's a, a, a Greek that was in the French Foreign Legion that went AWOL. And he left uh, to go back to Greece and and uh, and fight. Um, so yeah, there were there def and and Australia as well. Uh, so yeah, there were Greeks. But uh, what's interesting, what what became fascinating to me was the uh, the idea that there were uh, over forty thousand you know Greek Americans that left the United States. So that's a a huge number. The other ones are a lot smaller. But yeah, it would be fascinating to to do a, a study on that. Uh, Peter, I've got to ask, we're getting several more questions are rolling in, and I didn't know, you know, you're in a different time zone. He's in New York, we're in Oregon, so it's much later for Peter right now. Uh, do you have more time? Or I sure do, of course I do. Okay, so I want to make sure before we take advantage of you. Uh, so again, they keep your questions coming in. If you'd like, uh, use the Q&A button in the bottom of your screen, uh, and we'll keep going. So the next question then is, and thank you, Peter, by the way, uh, the next question is, what was the role of the Greek monarchy, especially in light of the royal family's German ties? Mm -hmm. that's, that's an interesting question. Well, um, so at this time, um, the, the connections that, that, you're, that we're, we're going to discuss now are um, heavily influenced by the fact that Constantine the I um, is his father's assassinated in 1913, early 1913, and by an anarchist. And so he becomes, you know, uh, the king. And he was 
um, although he had connections, very close ties, they grew, they grew through his wife. Um, during the Balkan Wars, um, he was, so the influence, the greatest influence on Constantine at this time, 1912, 1913, was the fact that he had been trained, he had studied in the military academy in, uh, in Germany. So that's what molded his uh, strategies. And as the commander in chief of uh, military forces, you know, he saw the he saw the the war in a different light than uh, the government. The government represent represented by, of course, Eleftherios Venizelos. So Venizelos had a, a different outlook, right? So his uh, his motives, um, his diplomacy was all in line with what was going to be supported by England and France. And he knew that they were the ones that were going to call the shots no matter what. So if he always had the backing and if it was, if it was within everyone's interest, it would ultimately be in the greatest interest of Greece to play along with that. Um, Constantine, again, because of his training and now the influences that he had, like I said, he saw things quite differently and he played this the notion out I, I mentioned earlier with Bulgaria, attack and take the capital. If the capital is taken, then there is no longer a, a Bulgarian issue uh, or question. Uh, and that happened as well in Asia Minor. And we saw how that didn't play out as well. So there was an influence, but it, it was not, it, we're talking pre-World War I, right? Pre-World War I, so they were still not embedded in, you know, the influences, so to speak, of, you know, Germany. Um, a lot of these questions we're getting, if we, if some of them are um, already answered in your book, we need to say, buy the book, because we're saying that anyway. We want people to read and get the answer, so don't spill all the beans if we can. But I know also a lot of these questions are about different eras before and after the whole event, so it's quite fascinating. I think a future projects for you to write about. <laughs> well, <Yeah. laughs> um, Next question. Greece went into Asia Minor at the behest of Great Britain, France, and the United States. I guess that's not really a question. A Actually, that's not that's not factual. That's that's not how it played out. That's not really how you know what. That's 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 not no, not no. So the idea is that um, there was supposed to be a police state established, and it was supported by the West, the United States. Not, not, not so much, if at all. Um, and uh, the the uh, the army was supposed to be sent in to protect uh, the um, the Christian minorities. You know, which was obviously you know Smyrna had a large, huge Christian Greek minority, and they were supposed to just uh, you know play a, a police role. Uh, and instead, they they decided under orders to continue into Asia Minor. So there was supposed to be a, uh, a referendum at some point, and the referendum would definitively decide the outcome of Smyrna. Uh, so the invasion of Asia Minor was not what was originally set up. So that's where we start talking about influences uh, of Germany on, on the royalty. So that's, that's for later. Okay. Uh, next question. Uh, when did the Ottoman Pasa, is that the correct way to pronounce? The Pasha, based, yeah. Based in Thessaloniki, actually leave Greece? So these individuals that you're talking about that we see in a lot of uh, the illustrations that, you know, are giving up their swords and giving up their battle flags and standards. Um, so in Thessaloniki, uh, when... The, the Greeks beat the Bulgarians by a very, very short amount of time in taking the city. So when they first entered, and as a matter of fact, the, the, one of the first units, if not the first Greek military units to step foot in Thessaloniki, uh, there was a, an Americanized Greek army officer that was a part of I had the head of that unit that, took, that stepped in. And so the, um, the, the Ottomans... Uh, the Ottoman representative wanted to uh, surrender to the Greeks before anybody else. 
they believed that if they were to surrender to the Bulgarians, that the Bulgarians were going to do some very, very uh, inhumane things to them and to the non-Christian population, which we don't know, you know, there was animosity towards uh, the Greeks. So we don't know, but the Ottomans believed that it was in their best interest, no questions asked, to surrender to the Greeks. And then when the Bulgarians came in, they had to redo the whole thing. They had to kind of restage it because the Bulgarians were allies and they were insulted. But uh, the Ottomans immediately um, had um, initially surrendered to the Greeks and they were then held uh, as prisoners of war um, and they were paid. The Greek government paid all of the Ottomans that were captured were paid their salaries. Uh, they were treated humanely. They were given their salaries. Uh, they were kept in camps, um, and so they were prisoners of war. Which I thought, I th what 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 I found when I found that they were actually paid. That was, you know, they borrowed money. The Greek government borrowed uh, money to, um, you know, f for the war. So they used some of that to actually pay these people their salaries, but. That's just the way it was. You know, they were treated humanely. They weren't, you know, put into concentration camps or work camps. They were, you know, uh, treated with respect, including the soldiers. I guess a good flip side of that is a question that came next. Were the Greeks of Turkey subjected to paybacks for Greek victories in the Balkan Wars? So what's interesting is that because of the turmoil that was going on Within the, um, the, the Ottoman Empire, there was uh, an overthrow of the Young Turks. Um, there was, you know, this, this movement to abolish uh, the Sultan and the old ways. So there was a lot going on and a lot of distractions uh, that were fortunate. However, uh, there were um, these, the, this issue, you know, the issue of the minorities. So in 1912 and 1913, uh, the war is going on. There's uncertainty. Everybody's mobilizing. So remember that by 1914, World War I is starting. So yes, there were issues throughout, but it was more into the World War I era that some of these, you know, um, not so much reprisals, but, uh, you know, the way that the mistreatment that was uh, arising, you know, the, um, the, the third class, second class, third class citizens were now looked upon as a burden and disloyal uh, individuals living in a, in a country that maybe they shouldn't be. So yeah, they were, they were being tr mistreated. There was a lot of mistreatment throughout, even before 1912. One of the excuses, one of the reasons that was constantly being brought up was the fact that you know the uh, the um, uh, minorities in the Ottoman Empire didn't have rights? Why didn't they have the same rights as everybody else? And so there was a big fear that ultimately there would be uh, genocide on a wide scale, and hence that's one of the the things that comes back with, um, of course, um, the uh, 1919 and Asia Minor and the rest of that, but. Not, not, on, not on a scale that we see later on. So not, not around this time. Okay, thank you. Um, do you have any data on how many of the early Greeks who immigrated to America in the early years were illiterate? Well, the, the data exists in terms of, uh, if we look into the records, you know, especially uh, if we look at some of the Ellis Island records, a lot of times and the census, if we look at some of the census, which I, I did look up on occasion, um, you'll see that some of them will say whether or not they're literate or not. Uh, what comes to mind, though, is the fact that there were multiple Greek language newspapers published in the United States, including um, illustrated magazines. So the Atlantis not only published a newspaper, they had a published, they published a, an illustrated magazine, sort of like a Time magazine, um, plus a bookstore of, of 
why would or how could uh, an individual, an immigrant to the United States, create a bookstore in Greek that sold Greek language books, not English language books, Greek books, and could not keep in stock enough of the novels and series that had been brought over leftovers from Greece if there wasn't a market for, you know, readers, readership. So, you know, most, most of these Greeks, right, every Cafe Neo had newspapers. Every Cafe Neo had newspapers. Not one, not two, they had newspapers in the Cafe Neo. If, if the majority of these men were truly illiterate, then why would you even bother having newspapers in uh, the, uh, the Cafe Neo, right? The Cafe Neo, the cafes were in everywhere there was more than three Greeks, there was a Cafe Neo, right? So um, why would there be any of that? And dozens of newspapers, if these men were all illiterate, as, you know, has been said, uh, which, is, which is completely wrong, false. So numbers, there probably exist. Uh, I didn't really touch, you know, go into that in depth. But what I did find fascinating was, and I have a list of uh, the newspapers that were actually active uh, at the time in my book. So that, that might help shed some light into, you know, their level of, of reading and writing. I mean, we know there were doctors. For that matter, there were doctors, law, Greek lawyers here. There were professionals and all different white collar uh, jobs that were here as well. Um, no, so the bulk of the men that came here were not high school graduates. They weren't college graduates but they sure knew how, how to read and write. The majority of them knew how to read and write. Interesting. Uh, out of curiosity, do you happen to know the name of the Greek bookstore in Brooklyn, even though it no longer exists? It's in my book. Okay, there you go. There was a fantastic article written in a local New York uh, newspaper of the time. And um, it, it was a huge spread. And they, they, the reporter went there, went to the bookstore, talked to the owner, obviously spoke to the owner because the owner spoke English. And they, uh, he had a, um, a guide with him. And it, it was just mind blowing to, to look into the world of, you know, 1912 and what it was to live here. Uh, so that kind of stuff is, it's, it's in the book. Um, and I think if you're interested in something like that, you'll find that I, I tried to cover that. I actually put in who the main players were. So if you were to read something from that time, you're going to hear names of individuals that are like, who is this guy? What, you know, they keep mentioning the name. Who is it? And, and it, at some point it becomes distracting. So, oh, that's, that's the prime minister of Bulgaria. Oh, that's this guy. Oh, that's who that guy is. So I put in a list of the prominent individuals, both in Greece both in, you know, the, the countries uh, that were associated with the Balkan Wars, including some of the, um, the Ottoman leaders and generals, as well as uh, some of the uh, community leaders here in the United States, so that in case, you know, you started to read anything else, you know, you'd know who they are. Because um, the newspapers and American newspapers covered all of this in detail. So it was just incredible. We're going to take another quick commercial break. This one is going to be to remind all of our listeners that you can order your own copy of the book at Annie's Bloom's Books or Powell's Books in the local Portland market or online at Barnes & Noble or from Amazon Kindle. And uh, maybe we can work out arrangement to have uh, autographed copies available as well. We'll try and we'll talk to Peter about maybe doing something like that. Yeah, um, we could. We could. The, the, the beauty of um, there's pros and cons and everything. The pandemic has made this possible. And, uh, you know, in, in uh, I guess one way of looking at this is that we're able to reach out uh, to more people at once over, you know, greater spans of, uh, you know, geography that uh, we wouldn't do. I mean, in a perfect world, I'd be in, uh, you know, Hokum, I'd be there, you know, personally, and I'd get a chance to, you know, autograph the books in person, uh, which I would love to do. Um, but I've given, you know, many of these presentations now and, you know, to get the word out. But uh, yeah, if, um, if you pick up, if you get a copy of the book, you can find me on Facebook. Uh, if you reach out, um, I will send you 
a, um, a personalized book plate so that you can uh, then insert in the book. So, you know, if you get a, a hard copy, you know, let me know and uh, send me a picture. This is how we'll do this. So for anyone that's interested in things like this, you find me on Facebook, send me a picture of you with the book and you get me your address and I will personalize a book plate, all right? It's, it's uh, specially made, it's archival so that you can then stick it onto wherever page you want in the book itself. You tell me the name of the person and I will personalize it and I will send it out to you, no cost to you. You got to send me that picture and I'll do that for you. How's that, Tom? You like oh, that? that? Sounds great. Uh, thank you very much. What I'll do is uh, watch this website in the next couple of days. We'll, we'll update our post there. We'll put a link to uh, Peter's Facebook page and you can click directly to it and get that happening. So that'd be uh, wonderful. Excellent. Yeah, you can do that. All right. Uh, more questions. Uh, let's see. Uh, what is the reason for the second Balkan war? Oh, the second one's a good one. And, and it all has to do with the fact that the Bulgarians believed that they should have been at, uh, they should have been the victors bar none. Uh, the Bulgarians believed erroneously that they had the strongest army in the Balkans, that there were nobody else in the Balkans, you know, never mind Romania or anybody else uh, that could come close to the might of the Bulgarian army. So therefore, uh, based on their, quote, victories, they believed that they should have um, a port in the Aegean, right? So that was part of their goal. Their goal was to take Salonika. Thessaloniki was, they, they had, uh, their aim was to take Thessaloniki. Uh, they wanted to take Constantinople, which they got very close to and to make sure that they had ports um, on the Aegean. So that was uh, not done. They, they, they weren't able to get that. They weren't able to accomplish that. Um, they were not happy with the decisions that were being made at the end of the uh, First Balkan War. They felt that they were being cheated. So um, the, it, it came to a head, and uh, Serbia and Greece then uh, had to defend the borders uh, that were being laid out and the Bulgarians attacked first. They figured that if they can uh, take as much as they can physically, you know, uh, with their military, extend their lines, that then they would say, this is the new borders of the Bulgarian nation. And so they, um, they attacked and they did not expect to lose, especially not to Greeks, to, to the Greek army, and then, of course, the Serbians fought them, and then the Romanians mobilized, and the Romanians, um, they took a little bit of uh, uh, land as well, and the Bulgarians realized they couldn't take everybody on, not to mention there was issues, of course, with the Ottomans. The Ottomans were still in this as well, and so the Bulgarians quickly decided that, you know, uh, we should stay, we should stop, and, um, you know, the uh, the king had extended himself a little bit too much again. And so it was in everybody's best interest, especially Greece, to stay where they were. Um, and so the uh, Bulgarians lost the second Bulgarian, you know, the, uh, the second uh, Balkan War. Um, and luckily it was a short war for, I think, everybody involved. Well, not so much for the Bulgarians because they, they took a beating and Greece doubled their size. So... Uh... Did Turkey gain territory in the Second Balkan War? Well, no. Turkey lost. Turkey, Turkey and Europe became basically, basically more or less what we know now today. Uh, so they lost, you know, northern, all of, you know, north of Greece. Uh, you know, they lost territory to Bulgaria, the Serbians, you know, Greek, uh, you know, all of that area they lost. Uh, however, they took back some territory from the Bulgarians uh, at the end of the Second uh, Balkan War. But, I mean, they lost, Greece doubled its size at the expense of the Ottomans. So the Turks really, they took, of course, they took the major, a major beating. Um, but 
they did not lose Constantinople. So the Bulgarians, Bulgarians made a, a real mad dash and uh, almost accomplished that. So that would have been a, a big to do, but no, they really didn't get anything. Uh, man, the questions keep coming in. Uh, at the end of World War I, Compton Mackenzie, in, in his memoirs, states that the British stopped a Greek advance towards Constantinople. Is this documented anywhere else? It is. It's documented in uh, if if you if 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 that's if that's where it, yeah it's out there, it's out there. Um, and I can tell you the first time I heard that I was in Greece and I heard it from one of my uh, uh, well-educated university graduated cousins had mentioned it to me. I of course had never heard that before. Um, so it's out there. You're gonna have to dig very very deep to get that but uh yeah it's 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 out there it's definitely out there um is the term second battalion translation of eros logos a term about 24 centuries old it seems very fitting and i may be pronouncing that incorrectly okay eros logos is sacred company or holy holy company sacred company it, that's that's what it's uh, Lojos is a company. So there, that's that's referring to the sacred company, but um, the sacred company is almost always when it's brought up, it's it's it talks about the uh, either something to do with 1821 or World War II. There's a sacred company, of course, that fought heroically in Second Battle of El Alamein. And, and so they were very active in World War II. I have an uncle that fought in it uh, or served in it uh, as an officer. But um, there were these sacred now uh, companies uh, in, in the Balkan Wars. Okay, thank you. Who started these wars? Who started the That's Balkan the Wars? I, yeah. We... we we, I kind of touched upon that uh, earlier. Um, it's, I made sure, it's a great question, but I made sure that I covered that in the openings of the book itself so that, you know, it was better understood. Um, and it was basically inevitable to happen. There was going to be some kind of a war in the Balkans at this time, uh, no matter what, right? So the time... And the place was determined by actions other than Greece's. But Greece was preparing for war, period. There was, it was going to happen, and it was in everybody's mind. Actually, they thought that it would happen earlier. Thank you. Uh, next question. How did the Ottomans get involved in the Second Balkan War? What was their role? Well, the, the Ottomans were... were uh, um, they were involved with the Bulgarians, right? Because remember, the Bulgarians wanted to take Constantinople. So uh, the Ottomans were, you know, that's that's their role. Their role was basically, you know, uh, keep trying to keep the Bulgarians in check. Okay, thank you. Uh, one more, let's see. What is the history behind the creation of North Macedonia? Was there division that it was not part of Greece? No, it wasn't part of Greece. Epiros was not part of Greece. Remember, I told you that the Greek kingdom was half of what it is today, right? Literally half of what it is today was the Greek kingdom in 1912. So when the war breaks out, everyone, you just think half, and that's what it was. So all of that wasn't, but I did cover, I did put in the Macedonian issue um, is covered in my book. Um, not to the extent, you know, proportionally speaking, you know, my work is the the uh, the Balkan Wars of 1912 to 1913. But what was going on, you know, behind the scenes up to October of 1912 was the Macedonian struggle. So that was a big part of, you know, um, a between the Bulgarians, the Greek government, uh, the peoples that lived there, and this tug of war. So I did, I did cover some of that in the book just to give context because nothing lives or, or happens in a void. So 
you know, I had to put some of that in. So, and, and, and the resolution was of course, to try to get, you know, the, the biggest land grab that you could based on the, the, the populations that live there. So, you know, the idea that, you know, Greece was going to try and take areas or land that didn't have Christian representation or Greek speaking representation, that was stretching, right? That was truly stretching. But the idea that, you know, Greece wanted to unify with the Greek speaking Christians around, that was definitely, you know, the main focus of what they were trying to do. Um, what was your motivation for researching and writing for this book? And then also, what's next in store for you? All right. So in terms of motivation, well, as a military historian studying, studying uh, um, student, you know, studying Greek history, um, you know, the modern Greek state uh, outside of independence, uh, there is... Uh, few, like I'd mentioned before, few true victories, um, not to mention this, um, you know, connection with, uh, you know, the Greek Americans, uh, it fascinated me, you know, the idea that, you know, how did this take place? Wh where did it, where did it take place? And um, could someone in, you know, outside of Greece, could someone in another country, in another language, fully understand what transpired during the 20th century, prior to World War I, and, you know, how successful could you be? And so that was part of, you know, everything that kind of just rolled one into the other. And I decided, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see. And I thought that, you know, I would quickly extinguish uh, my resources. I figured, you know, I'm not going to be able to find much. And so maybe I'll write a big paper, you know, and, and, and present the paper. And the more I started digging, I started finding. And um, when I, when I tapped into newspapers as a primary source, I, I turned away thousands. I've read thousands of pages of news uh, uh, from 1912 and 13. I also archived thousands of pages that I didn't include in my book, not to mention academic papers. I have no less than 300 academic papers that in some way, shape, or form are related to the Balkan Wars. Um, there's a lot that's been written, and I was surprised. And the a lot is in English, mind you. This is not something that I researched in Greek. So the Greek I made sure that it wasn't more than 5% of my research for fact-checking was going to Greek sources. Um, I also used um, uh, Garibaldi, Ricciotti Garibaldi's book on um, the Garibaldi Legion and his participation is in Italian. So I translated a third of that book so that I could get that story, um, uh, give it its proper due because it never has been. Uh, the uh, the Battle of Drisco and the Garibaldi Legion of 1912. Uh, there's there's really not that much written about it. Their story and what they accomplished doesn't exist outside of my book. So that was part of you know what I ultimately got involved with. I I almost gave up writing the book three at least three times uh, based on the bulk of information that I found. Um, and then, you know, so I willed it down to under 700 pages. Uh, and it's, it's really, it's not a novel, obviously, it's, it's nonfiction, it's a historical work. And it's, it's, a, it's a reference book, but it has many uses. If you're interested in history, you're interested in this period, you want to know about the Greek American pioneers, you want to know what these heroes did before, during and after, I included that. I included, uh, like I said, context, a little historical American context, world context, um, and, you know, some of the writings that have been lost, uh, like I mentioned, archives. I used some archives that have never been used before, so I brought that all together, and I figured if I only got one shot in life to do something justice, this is it, and uh, my next project is... I have a novel that takes place in the Balkan Wars I'd like to do. 
Um, I'd like to do a book on um, the Balkan Wars in a hundred pictures. So I've, I'm, I'm working on, on that as we speak. Um, and I, uh, I think I would also like to finish translating Garibaldi's book, but um, I also want to mention that uh, I have been given uh, the honor to write a historical column for one of the last remaining in print uh, newspapers called the National Herald. Um, we should all be familiar with the uh, the, the Greek uh, daily, uh, you know, published uh, American published uh, newspaper. But they also have uh, an English version that they publish uh, once a week. And so um, bi monthly, I will be. I've already published my first the column has been published, and so I'm going to be contributing to the English section. So that's basically where I'm going. Wow, fascinating. Well, I want to say thank you, Peter, for that fascinating summary and presentation. It's been a very enlightening evening, and for me anyway, I've learned a lot. I've already ordered my copy of your book. I will <laughs> thank you. you a photo of it in my hand so I get a copy of the name, your signed plate for it. I appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Uh, and again, there will be a link on our website to Peter's Facebook page so that and it's actually listed down in the chat's window as well, and you can uh, make that communication directly. Uh, and reminding all of our listeners that we can also order your own copy of the book at Annie Bloom's Books or Pal's Bookstore in the local Portland market or online at Barnes & Noble or from Amazon Kindle. By the way, I don't know if you're aware of this, but we've had a, so a lot of our guests, our visitors tonight are from the Portland area, but we have one from Australia that's noted. So we, they're from all over the world. The world is a small place. So we thank everybody for coming. Uh, I want to thank all of you that joined us today. The Hellenic American Cultural Center and Museum was very proud to bring this special event to you. And the generous support from followers such as each of you has helped us continue to fund future events, both online and at our museum location in Portland, Oregon. Again, reminder, you can donate at any time at HellenicAmericanCC.org. And now I'd like to return uh, the, the uh, podium to our president of the Hackham, the Hellenic American Cultural Center and Museum, uh, to Annie McGowan. Nanny, you can take your mute off. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. I just want to say thank you so much to Peter for your great presentation. I learned a ton. Um, and looking forward to actually having you come out to Portland, Oregon for a live presentation sometime soon when we're able to. I also want to thank Tom for a wonderful moderation that you did, Tom. And I, your Greek is very good, by the way. Um, I also thank you, all of you who attended tonight's presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. And as Tom said, uh, you can go out to the HellenicAmericanCC.org uh, and make a donation that helps us continue to bring you presentations like these from wonderful people like Peter. Thank you all again and good night. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate the invitation. I am at your disposal. So hack them, Tom, and thank you so much. And Australia, if that's Terry, thank you so much. So everybody, uh, I appreciate uh, your support. Uh, please read history. Please stay safe and hope to see you guys again in the future. Thank you so much.